Hi there, welcome back to uh, History and Politics Chat at uh, 4 o'clock on Tuesday afternoon. Today is October 6, 2020. My name is Heather Cox Richardson. I am a professor of history, but when I do these talks, I do not speak for my employer. All right, so you guys had a lot of questions today with good reason. So let me start with something that I've also planned to end with. And that is, I don't know if you noticed, but I think in the first 20 minutes that I asked if you had questions, there were 2,500 questions. And that says to me um, that you have less interest perhaps in my questions than in having somebody help you navigate where we are and where we're going. And where I wanna start then today is it feels to me, this is not a historical observation except to the degree that I have been trained to some degree to look at popular moments. You know, my, my degree is not in American history, it's in the history of American civilization, which means that I studied cultural movements as well as literature and religion and art and all the things that go to make up America. That's why I won't talk about any other countries because most historians are trained to do a number of countries. I was not, I was trained to do just America. And that's why I won't, I won't but, but from, from a whole bunch of different lenses, from literature and art, as I say, as well as religion and politics and um, environment and all kinds of different ways. So anyway, uh, I have perhaps a little bit of experience in reading the the um, mega text, if you will, of the moment we're in. And it feels to me like people are waiting for the adults to come into the room because for so long we have been able sort of to be focused on our own lives and to let the, to trust that our elected representatives, uh, the executive branch, the judicial branch, that those things were going to hum along. I mean, even if we didn't necessarily like the people in charge from one side or another, you could go to sleep at night being pretty sure that those branches and the people in them were going to be there tomorrow. And the reality is right now that has broken down. For the first time, I think in any of our lifetimes, for those of us who are still alive to be talking about this today, and people are nervous and they're scared and they're, they're really concerned. And I mention that because we're waiting for the adults in the room, but we are the adults in the room. You know, anybody who has ever been in charge of younger people to whom you are an authority figure, a mom or an aunt or an uncle or a firefighter or a teacher or a nurse or a doctor, you know that what people are waiting for is someone to tell them things are going to be all right. So even if you don't know that they're going to be all right, you say, yeah, this is what we're going to do next. That's us now. Uh, that's the position we're in. So as I'm going to answer your questions today, when people are like, well, what happens if Trump does this? What happens if this happens? You know what happens if those things occur? We fix them. We take care of them. You know, just the same way that, you know, when your kid fell out of a tree and broke his arm and you went, oh my God, you didn't go, oh my God, someone do something. You fixed it. You took him to the doctor and you got it fixed. So I want to start today with the idea that everything I'm going to tell you, I'll certainly fill in the backstory and all that, we are our own saviors. Uh, there are a lot of good people working in the country right now and they're doing their job and it's we have a job to do too. So before anybody panics and feels like everything's lost and nothing can be done and all that, no, no, we are our own saviors. All right, so let's go ahead and get to your questions. And I'm gonna end up again there as well. Um, and once again, I want to reiterate that I am going to tell you what these questions say, but always people who write them sound more intelligent than I do when I say them. All right. So um, Charlie Louise Gonerman asked, why is the press only focusing on Trump and Trump's health? Why aren't they reporting on the election interference and Trump's bankruptcy and the peaceful demonstrations and climate change and so on? Is it that the media is dictated by the same old big money? And um, uh, is this the next one? Yeah, there's a similar question by Jacqueline McMahon Flown who said, you know, I'm finding that people prefer to focus on Trump rather than focusing on, um, on Joe Biden or Kamala Harris and they barely make the news. And why is that? Because in fact, their plans for coronavirus and fixing the economy and all that are very detailed and are, you know, really quite reasonable plans that we should all be discussing and why don't they get more airtime? All right, so that's a really great question. And, um, and, and this is actually a real problem for the media, not so much with the media, although that too, but for the media. And that is that it, what Trump does is news. Trump has figured out something that Joe McCarthy pioneered in the 1950s. And that is 
what essentially has become reality TV, that if you want to grab headlines, you need to occur always. There's always got to be something. And if you think about it, and I hate to sound reductionist here, but the fact that we are our heads are constantly turning from motion is one of the things that keeps us addicted to screens and certainly keeps us addicted, addicted to television. Because if you didn't pay attention to that movement in the bushes, you were going to be eaten by a saber-toothed tiger. Mind you, I'm an American historian. I don't really know if we would have been eaten by saber-toothed tigers. But my point is that you need to be aware of your circumstances all the time or uh, you're, you're going to be in trouble. And so that occurrence that I'm happening, I'm happening, I'm happening, that is something that Joe McCarthy pioneered for modern, um, modern media in the 1950s with his constant stories that come out just before the news breaks. And, you know, people had to cover them because so even if he was lying and people knew he was lying, you know, the, the reporters have these these exchanges with people where they're like, we know he's lying and we know we shouldn't cover it. But when the 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 when a senator says that the president of the United States is a communist agent, it's news. I mean, it's not news if the drunk on the corner does it, but if the senator does it, it's news. So what on earth can we do? Some newspapers in the 1850, 19, I'm sorry, 50s tried to claw back their coverage of McCarthy and put it on the fourth page. And they were so screamed at by their readers, they put it back on the front page. And by the time they corrected it, of course, people had internalized whatever it was that McCarthy was saying. And the corrections went unnoticed. Well, Trump in many ways is McCarthy taken to an extreme. He is constantly erupting, constantly uh, grabbing, grabbing news. And he does it with the understanding that any news, as he would say, is good news. So if he is trying to cover up a bad story, he will throw anything at the media and they will run with it and he will grab headlines away from whatever it is he's trying to call attention to. And this is happening again and again and again. And, and frankly, I get this. I mean, you, you may have seen if you read my letters the last couple of nights, I've made it a real effort to try and put a lot of, a lot of, uh, of um, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris in them, simply because I didn't want Trump to get all the oxygen. But really, when you're looking at uh, where we are in this moment of a crisis in America, the whole point is that Joe Biden does not grab headlines. He's kind of a return to a normalcy where you could trust that you could wake up in the morning and not have to reach for your phone to see what on earth had happened in the last 15 minutes. And, and I'm tr totally not kidding. I, I've actually been trying to work all day. And every time I go on Twitter, there's another blockbuster story. And, you know, and there's a couple of things that happen with that. First of all, it means you can't look away. But second of all, it does disrupt your life. And as your life is disrupted, your feet get knocked out from under you and you are more and more susceptible to disinformation. And that is a very, very deliberate part of Trump's disinformation to try and knock us all off our pins. So as media, what do you do? How do you cover that? And why do you cover it that way? What is going on in the White House right now uh, with the spread of COVID-19 through the White House's inner circle and now within the last... Uh, hour and 20 minutes, we learned it is now um, that our that the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, General Milley, and certain other members, high-ranking members of our military are all quarantining because they've all been exposed at what appears to have been an event in, on Sunday that had not been publicized for Gold Star Parents. By the way, a Gold Star Parent, if you don't know, is um, a parent uh, who has lost uh, a child in combat in um, in, uh, generally overseas, obviously, um, but they're they're a special. The, the gold star they used to be gold star mothers. Gold star mothers are they were very symbolic in American history. And if you do not know what they are, you're a very lucky person, uh, just like me, who has not lost a child in service to the United States. But if you wondered what a gold star family was, that's what they are. And they're 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 traditionally considered really. Um, uh, I mean, what what greater sacrifice is there to make for this country? So that's why it was such a big deal when Trump. Um, uh, uh, attacked the um, the Gold Star parents in 2016 uh, because he didn't like the way they um, uh, they were approaching his presidency. In any case, or his candidacy. Okay, so in any case, um, uh, it's very hard to look away from what's happening because it is one of the greatest crises in American history. But and here's a big but that I hope I'm going to keep hitting on this week. You're right. 
you can't watch him all the time. And the reason for that is, I mean, aside from your mental health, but just taking a look at the way society changes and the way society moves, if we are always boxed in by the horizons that Donald Trump and the current day Republican Party sets for us, we have no future. That is, think about it as a, almost as a logic problem. If he sets the terms of the logic, you can't ever move away from that. And so one of the things that's going to be really important to do for the next month, and you can see, and, and after, and after, and you can see it um, in the way that the Biden campaign is pivoting right now. Isn't it actually lovely to have be able to use the word pivot for real? The way the Biden camp is pivoting is to talk about an American future that is not bound by the um, the walls that the Trump administration has put around us. So to that end, I'm really going to be pushing that idea and really trying hard to do that in the letters, not necessarily because I'm pushing a political agenda so much as the idea of the sort of philosophical idea that we do not want to be bound right now in a prison of the current day Republican Party's making. Um, if it were a normal election, a normal time where you had one or, I'm sorry, two or more parties advancing different policies, you could, there, there wouldn't be walls. We could say, well, you want this and you want this and let's talk about that and let's see which ones we like and where we think there might be room to take one from here and one from, we don't have that right now. So what we have is these closing walls on the one hand and on the other hand, our own ability to look and say, that's not the country I want. That's not what I want things to look like and to try and envision a different future. And, and to their credit, the Biden camp and uh, Kamala Harris's camp, along with their input from Bernie Sanders and um, Elizabeth Warren and P Pete Buttigieg and all these people I'm sure I'm forgetting, they have been very, very good about advancing really quite detailed plans and, um, and, and not necessarily as fait accompli, but rather as, you know, let's talk about this. Here's some things that one could do. So, for example, Biden's position on police reform, which is a, a caricature of the way that the Republicans are looking at it. He says, listen, we have a problem with the allocation of resources. Police departments are being asked to do way more than they ever have before, and they don't have the resources for it. One of the things we're going to need to do is to increase their level of resources and hive off some of the things that police officers are being asked to do um, that they that they are not equipped to do. You know, the, the mental health interventions, the social work, all the things that they were never intended to do. And in the process, of course, there are actual police reforms as well that need to have on a banning of chokeholds, for example, uh, which has been so devastating. Um, and and um, and, uh, and the getting rid of the no-knock warrants, which are, um, you know, f frankly, a bit of a no-brainer. As a friend of mine is an expert on, um, on no-knock warrants said to me that the idea behind, originally behind no-knock warrants was dur during the war on drugs, that you wanted to be able to burst into something so that people couldn't flush the, the drugs that they had. And she said, you know, first of all, you know, you can shut the pipes. So, you know, so things can't be flushed. But second of all, um, the, if you think about how much could actually be flushed in the, in the 30 seconds it takes to say police and open the door, um, that's the, the amount of, of drugs that, you know, a, a, a single user might have, but you're not going to wash away a, a crack house or a, a major, um, you know, a major depot for drugs. So the whole concept, the whole logic of uh, no-knock warrants was always flawed. And so that's kind of one of those things that, that Biden has put on the table that is frankly kind of a no-brainer when you think about it, as opposed to going like, oh, no, we can't do it, make any changes. So um, so to their credit, they've been, they've been really quite thorough. And you can read those proposals at the Biden website. You can also, of course, listen to his town halls. He did a terrific town hall in Miami yesterday. Um, got great marks all around for it, and it never made the news because Trump was busy standing on the balcony um, wheezing or gasping for breath. So um, so part of it is just us taking matters into our own hands and talking about something else, but it's hard for the media because they do have a job to tell you what's going on. And what's going on is, you know, our, our, our White House has become a super spreader of a deadly disease. If you were, honest to God, if you were writing this as a screenplay, you couldn't sell it because it's it's too crazy. And they somehow have to inform us of that at the same time that they try and keep us apprised of what's going on. And again, remember, everybody's got a word limit. So, so one of the things that's a constant battle, for certainly for somebody like me, I, I try and hold myself to a 1,200 word word limit every day. And 
you fit everything that's happening into 1200 words. It's like something's got to give. And so that stuff tends, um, tends to be Biden because Biden, you can sort of trust is going to be there, which is after all his great appeal. I mean, one of his great appeals. All right, so um, so more questions here. Okay, so Don Ray Ammon asked this question about the history of the Secret Service. And, and I really wanted to do this question, even though I'm sure I'm gonna take it in a direction that uh, Don Ray did not expect. And, um, and should I, you know, can I speak out about the Secret Service and why uh, the president is putting, why is it such a big deal that the president is putting them in this kind of danger? Is this really the first time we have seen this? So let me start, first of all, with, um, with, is this the first time we've seen this sort of thing? Yes, yes, because this is the first time in American history where we have seen a deadly virus that we understood and that we knew how to stop and that it became a political statement to refuse to stop it. This is bizarre. We're in bizarro land and this has never happened. So the, the Secret Service puts itself in danger. To say that you are willing to be a part of the Secret Service is uh, you know, an astonishing thing. The idea that you would be willing to, to, to use your life to protect not, not a president, um, but rather the concept of the presidency. And certainly they're protecting a president, yes, and they do take bullets for a president, but they're doing more than that. They are saying that they care enough about our system, literally, to put their bodies between the, our elected head of government and the dangers that surround that person. That's huge. That's a huge thing. And now let's think about all the accolades they get for that. Oh, I know, they get none. You know, they're dressed in black in the dark, in the dark uh, uh, sunglasses. And, you know, they're, they're, you know, they come and they go. And the whole point is you don't ever look at or see a Secret Service agent. That's a really big deal. And that's, uh, um, uh, that, that itself, I think, is worth sort of remembering and holding on to. And then to think about the fact that this particular president has put them in harm's way, not by the act of some crazed gunman, um, which itself is bad enough, but frivolously. The idea that they simply don't matter, that they have been willing to lay down their lives for him and he couldn't put on an expletive mask to protect them. And that he demanded that they get into that hermetically sealed SUV so that he could do a drive-by around the hospital. That's a level of disrespect for their sacrifice and for their lives that I certainly don't know of any similar situation in history. So just to honor them a little bit, I'd like to tell you about their history because their history is really quite cool. And this is the part where if you're not interested in the history, you should go um, get a cup of coffee or, you know, a chocolate cookie or something. Um, uh, because this is the um, uh, the history portion of the show here. I just closed the tab I had open. Um, all right, so the history of, of the Secret Service is really quite interesting. Why do we have a Secret Service? You know, where do they come from? Well, they come from their, their origins. I can tell you the, the official history, but the origins, because I've actually read these books for other reasons. They actually have the history of the Secret Service, by the way, back here. Um, I, I have a, an original copy of the, the original book. Um, uh, the um because i couldn't resist it uh, the uh there was nobody to protect the president until the civil war and what happens is that there was no need to i mean the president literally walked around the streets of washington because you know you were a civilian and if people didn't like you um they would vote you out there was not a sense that the president was in danger and when the civil war breaks out um the Abraham Lincoln, of course, is not in Washington because it breaks out before he's inaugurated. And when he comes into the, into the city of Washington for his inauguration, there are threats that he is going to be assassinated. And when that happens, he actually sneaks in to the city and he gets such crap for it. He says, that's it. Never again. I'm going to take my chances with assassins because I will never let myself be this humiliated again. But once it's clear that he's in some kind of danger, a, an opportunist, basically, a guy named uh, Pinkerton, Alan Pinkerton, goes ahead and, um, and decides that he is going to begin to protect uh, the president. 
And he sort of does, he's sort of official-ish. And I shouldn't put it that way because a lot of people are like, ah, oh, he started the Secret Service. But he was a real self-promoter. He's got, he wrote a lot of books, by the way, um, that you can, a lot of them you can find on Google Books if you're interested. He has one about, um, the eight, about 1871 that I absolutely love called um, something to the uh, Tramps, Detectives, strike no, Strikers, Tramps, Detectives, and Communists or something like that. I'm sure I've got those wrong, but those are the four words. And like, really? Okay. But anyway, he's, he's an interesting character. So he begins the process of protecting the president, but obviously he doesn't do a great job. I mean, that is, I, I'm being absolutely flippant. Um, he's not really the secret. There's not really a secret service detail. Lincoln walks in the streets without protection. And again, there's never been a presidential assassination. So no one is seeing what's going to come in 65 when John Wilkes Booth murders Lincoln at Ford's theater. So, so where does the secret service come in? So, so he, Pinkerton's theoretically protecting the president on occasion when he's asked to, but he is working during the Civil War because during the war, the uh, the, uh, federal government has to invent some kind of circulating medium and they invent money. And that's, you know, the American money. And they invent two kinds of money, by the way, but one that is, um, and they're both popular and I can explain the difference if you're interested, but one of them, the early one from 1862 is, um, is based on the government's willingness to pay and it's a piece of paper and it's printed on the front in black ink and on the back in green ink. These are the greenbacks. And if you have in your wallet on you right now, reach in and pull out and see if you have an old dollar bill, not one of the new ones with the stupid purple stripe and all that, which I know we have to have. I've, I've done my tour of the mint, but I'm afraid I don't have any money here. Um, let's see if I have any in my pockets to show you. I don't. Um, well, anyway, if you pull it out and look, um, you'll, you think that they're printed in green on both sides, but they're not. They're printed in black on the front. They're printed in green on the back. Uh, the green paper, the green tinge of the paper from the papers made by Crane Stationery in Massachusetts. Um, it has a, um, recycled material in it, by the way. Um, that's what makes you think that they're green entirely, but they're not. But so here's the problem. I don't know if you've ever done the tour of the... Um, the uh, the mint in uh, the treasury, I'm sorry, in Washington, D.C., but you will know that now we have engravers who spend years designing bills so that they can't be copy, they can't be counterfeited. So, for example, I, the one I remember from our tour last year was if you, and my eyes are not good enough to see this, but if you looked at a 50, I couldn't even see it when they had it blown up, but if you looked at a 50 on, on Grant's neck, one side or the other, there's an, either a name or a number written in things that are so small, as so I say, I couldn't see them. But there's all these tricks now in the dollar bills and in the bills so that they can't be easily counterfeited. You can't just Xerox them, right? So, so he, but here's the problem, and to go back to the Secret Service, in the 1860s, they, they didn't have that. They just had some guys who were sitting there drawing bills, and it didn't take much work for somebody else sitting at home to draw the same bills. And these counterfeit bills flooded the market, and it was a huge problem for the government because they they literally, I mean, they're, they're, these guys are ripping them off, and there's not much they can do about it. So the Secret Service becomes a, an anti-counterfeiting group, and that's why they're in the Treasury Department. So the Secret Service is actually a branch of the Treasury Department until 2003, when they get um, taken over by the Department of Homeland Security, once we get that after 9-11. After um, so the reason that they're in the Treasury Department is that they begin as a federal force to stop counterfeiting. And then, of course, they're the only federal force. And so they can tend to get lent out. You know, when people need some kind of information, they tend to borrow the Secret Service. And of course, that's going to stop in the early 20th century when we get the FBI. That's itself an interesting story and a different story, uh, a, a very interesting story, because um, um, we get J. Edgar Hoover. Um, and anyway, I'll tell you that someday if you're interested. But anyway, so. Um, so uh, so they begin to be the anti-counterfeit people, so they're in the Treasury Department. Well, great, right? So why do we still talk about them in conjunction with the presidency? Well, what happens is that, um, of course, uh, Garfield, uh, Lincoln is assassinated in 65, and then in 1881, James Garfield is assassinated and um, by, a, by a mentally ill office seeker, and the guy literally comes up to him. Garfield's in a train station in Washington, D.C. It's right now, there's actually a marker now for it on the mall, um, and it's right near the Museum of, um, of American Art. Um, 
And um, I'm trying to think of what the branch name is there. You can see it if you're there. There's a wayside. Uh, right now, the, the actual spot where he was assassinated is in the middle of, um, of a road, so they couldn't put a star there in favor because they were literally, we were afraid that people get run over. But um, but Garfield gets assassinated. He's literally in a train station, and, and Charles Guiteau walks up to him and shoots him in the back. I mean, it just, there's nothing between between Garfield and this this crazy man. And so um, people are like, wait, wait, it was bad enough, you know, when it happened to Lincoln in the middle of the Civil War, but at least that was a war. There's no reason to shoot Garfield. Like, he's a nice guy, and he's a, like, nobody doesn't, I mean, yeah, he gets into fights with people, as any president will, but he's actually really well regarded, really popular, like, like people are feeling, like, gentle toward him because his wife's been dying of malaria. She's better by then, and she does live a very long life. But... Um, but like, what did the, where did this come from? So now it's kind of on people's horizons that a president could be assassinated. But still, nobody does anything about it because they don't want to create these trappings of monarchy around a president. So then, in the um, after 1893, when uh, Grover Cleveland is elected in 92, and the Republicans very deliberately crash the economy in 93, which is sort of of interest today. Um, uh, Grover Cleveland is getting a ton of threats against his life, a ton of threats against his life. And finally, he's like, you have got to, somebody's got to protect me and my wife and kids. And so that's when the Secret Service begins. I mean, there no, there's nobody else to do it. The Secret Service begins to protect the president. And that's why they have been the presidential detail ever since Grover Cleveland's administration. And again, why they were within the Treasury Department. So they have a long and illustrious history as really the first, the first, um, police force in the executive branch. But I always loved that they were in the Treasury Department because of the fact that they stopped counterfeiting. So that is the history of um, the Secret Service. And and as I say, I, in a way they started, I, I won't say as a lark, Pinkerton goes on uh, to, to start the Pinkerton's detective agencies. So yeah, there was money in this for him. Um, he, he the, there's a real a very vague line between being a Pinkerton spook and being a, um, you know, sort of a thug in the late 19th century, the 1870s and the 1880s. But the service itself goes on until now, as I say, these people are, are literally people who have volunteered, not, I mean, they're getting paid for it, but they've chosen a profession where they are willing to lay down their lives to protect the elected body of the, the elected head of our government and the people surrounding uh, our, our elected, our elected um, officials, and that it just—that's not something anybody should take lightly, to my mind. And the idea that anybody would risk any life frivolously, but certainly to risk frivolously the lives of people who have volunteered to die to protect you, just seems to me—I'm not sure I have an adjective for it—egregious um, for sure. But it just seems to me—I hate to say disrespectful because that sounds mild but sort of disrespectful of the entire enterprise of American democracy and people's willingness to do all they can to protect it. Um, still not the right word, but I think you get what I mean. All right, so uh, that's the history of the Secret Service, a question from Don Ray Ammon. Now, um, um, a couple of questions here uh, about, uh, I'm gonna go down here to Victoria J. Kelly, The History and Context of Voter Fraud and Suppression. Um, it's, this is, it seems like the Republicans are most often convicted of this, and that's absolutely the case recently. But, um, but let's think a little bit about voter suppression, or, and winning elections for that matter, because there is a logical, a logical uh, way to think about this. So if you want to win an election in America, or in any democracy, but as you know, I specialize in America, you either you need to get you need to win the most votes with perhaps some exceptions recently when you can gave the electoral college which i'll talk about in a minute so what are your two methods of getting the most votes you can either expand who gets to vote or you can contract who gets to vote and those two systems for controlling who wins have been in play since the very beginning I had talked here before about how Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson games the Electoral College by making it a winner-take-all system. But he also disfranchises certain people in different places to make sure that his people are going to win. So, for example, before Jefferson, women voted in New Jersey. 
and they the his Jefferson's party takes the vote away from women in New Jersey because the women in New Jersey tend to tend to support um, the the party that Jefferson doesn't belong to the, the Federalists. So there's two ways to do things. You can either expand the vote or you can contract the vote. So let's think about um, about contracting the vote and how this happens. For the most part, after uh, between 1800 and 1828, uh, the election of Andrew Jackson, for the most part, um, most, um, most states increased who, got, who was allowed to vote. Now that still meant it was all, only white men. Um, but they increasingly let white men who didn't own a lot of property vote. They increasingly opened up the vote for, you know, for, for non-white men. And the reason for that, again, is that they're trying to, to, each side is trying to gain the system by getting more people to vote for their side. Um, then, um, so there's this sense early on that you're going to expand the vote. And then with the expansion of the vote, um, of course, we get the election of Jackson in 28 and 32, 18, 28, 1832. And then, um, then there's an issue in the, in the South, especially in the 1850s. And that is that the policies that the elite slave owners are pushing in the South, um, and th these would be the people who enslaved uh, more than 25 other human beings and who came to control the, the um, the, the governments of the South, um, they had a problem because the vast majority of Southerners, and I'm only talking about white Southerners when I say this, certainly they were, their policies were not beneficial to black Southerners, but a lot of white Southerners didn't like what they were doing either. So they begin to shut white people out of the vote. They begin to arrange affairs in such a way that only those who support enslavement and who support the continuing uh, domination of those elite slaveholders are able to vote. And so you start to see the contraction of the vote there in among the Democrats in the 1850s in the South. And the reason I set that up is because when we talk about voter suppression in the present, we uh, I'm going to work you back from that in a minute. But if you look at the late 19th century after the Civil War, when the, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments declare that African Americans are, are citizens and that African American men can vote, that's when you start to see a real pushback in American society from the idea that not everybody should vote, that, um, that maybe having everybody vote is not such a ducky idea. And the way that develops is this. During the Civil War, the Republican Party develops not only the concept of abolition, getting rid of human enslavement, except as punishment for a crime for which someone has been, has been convicted, um, but they also develop uh, our first national taxes, including the income tax. And after the war, as African Americans are voting in the South, they are voting for, um, for people who are going to rebuild the South. They're voting for people who talk about roads and railroads and schools and hospitals. And this is a big one, um, uh, prosthetics. You know, think of how many people in the South lost arms and legs and eyes, believe it or not. Uh, the traffic in eyes was a big, fake eyes was a big thing after the Civil War. And, um, and when there's, in the, um, in the Columbian Exposition of 1893, um, one of the things that, that America led the world in, in 1893, was prosthetics. You know, we don't really think a lot about that history, but America was really good at making, you know, uh, replacement arms and legs after the Civil War. So we led the world in that for a while. In any case, um, at least in the 19th century, I don't know where we stand this now, but, uh, but that was a big deal then. Um, so... Uh, so the idea among people who did not want African Americans to have a say in American society was, first of all, to be racist and say, we're just going to kill you people, and that's the KKK. But um, Ulysses S. Grant comes down on the KKK by creating the Department of Justice and by um, essentially declaring martial law in a number of counties in the American South, especially in South Carolina, and putting down the KKK, making it go underground. And so people who object to the participation of black Americans in American society try a new tactic. And what they say is, oh, you know, we don't, we don't care that these people are black. We care that they're poor and that they're voting for politicians who are going to be using tax dollars to do things like build roads and schools and hospitals and give people prosthetics. So our complaint is not race, which is unconstitutional under the constitutional amendments of the Reconstruction years. Our complaint is that these poor, uneducated people, thugs, whatever, 
are, um, are using their votes to call for policies that cost tax dollars and that therefore are going to redistribute wealth from our pockets as hardworking white people into the pockets of African Americans is what they're saying. Although of course they don't say that of, of field hands, lazy people, people that they think don't deserve to have um, access to good roads and schools and hospitals and all those sorts of things. With that formulation, which I really hope sounds familiar because it comes straight out of the post-Civil War years. With that formulation, it's a really small step to say, oh, listen, I don't care about African Americans voting. That's just fine with me. But I don't think these poor lazy people should vote. And so you get what is called the redemption of the American South in the 1870s, the mid 1870s. Um, when, when white Americans, white Southerners, white Southern Democrats um, basically chase African Americans and their, the, the white Republicans who will work with them away from the polls by having guns on the, on the, near the polls, by having poll watchers, another word you're hearing again, um, by making sure that any African American who votes recognizes that his, they'll be all men at this point, that his life is, is in danger. And in fact, before the election of 1868, um, which, is a, which is a series of state elections um, for the most part, uh, as many as as many as a thousand people are killed in the South over the right to vote. So the idea that it, it, it's Republicans who do it is certainly true now. But what we get out of Reconstruction is a one-party South. You know where people talk now about red states, and Stacey Abrams I think puts it very well when she says, "Don't talk about red states. Talk about voter suppression states." Because if you think about the states that are now instituting um, rules that are making it impossible for people to vote, yes, there are states that tend to vote Republican, but they wouldn't be voting Republican if there weren't voter suppression. And she made that very clear in Georgia, where she lost the Georgia governor race to Brian Kemp when Brian Kemp was the secretary of state in charge of overseeing who got to vote. And now we know he tossed um, at least 100,000 people off the rolls in order to make his victory possible. So first of all, uh, voting, voter suppression starts there under this system in the South. And it spreads after that into the North and West um, really dramatically after 1890 when Mississippi writes a new constitution called, stunningly, the Mississippi Constitution, in which what they do is they actually put walls around who can vote. And they do things like say, Different southern states say things like, you know, you can vote if your grandfather voted or there you can vote if you pay a poll tax, but you have to keep your receipt for having paid the poll tax for a year or you can uh, you can vote if you can adequately translate the Constitution or, you know, there's all kinds of barriers to voting. And of course, what it came down to was who the registrar would permit to vote. So it, after this happens in 1890, the Mississippi Constitution puts an education requirement on the vote. And Northerners look at that and they're really uncomfortable about the immigrants that are around, that are voting around them. And they say, hey, you know, that's not such a bad idea. And after 1890, every single state except one rewrites its state constitution to, um, to do a number of things, but also to limit who can vote. And I'm tempted not to tell you who the one state is so that, you know, when you get on, um, when you and I go up on Jeopardy together, I'll win that one. It's Massachusetts. All right, so why do we care now? We care now because, I mean, we care now because this is really the roots of where we get this weird, weird equation in America with the idea that if you let people of color vote, somehow you've got communism. I mean, that's just nuts. But it comes out of um, the, the debates in the South between 1871 and 1874. Um, but we care about it now because this is the same formula that what we are living with now, the Republican Party, is the exact same formula that the Southern Democrats used in the 1870s. And it's an argument that comes out of the Second Reconstruction, out of the passage, uh, I'm sorry, the Supreme Court decision of Brown versus Board of Education and later on the Civil Rights uh, Acts of the 1960s and the Voting Rights Act, which this uh, Supreme Court had gutted um, with Shelby v. Holder in 2013 and which uh, is now looking that it, like, that it might take even more out of that Voting Rights Act. And that's the equation that if you let people of color vote, and by the way, Nixon included this to, expanded this to include women as well. If you let people of color vote, what they will do is they will vote for policies 
that improve their lives. They'll vote for the roads and the schools and the hospitals and maybe for jobs programs and maybe for um, for SNAP benefits. And you know, they'll vote for things that cost tax dollars. And those tax dollars have to be paid for by people who have money. And in our society, the way it's set up, the people who have money overwhelmingly are white people. So what this, this equation that uh, people of color voting is going to mean a redistribution of wealth from hardworking white people to lazy African-Americans or people of color or feminist women, um, that's just an idea that's set up during Reconstruction that becomes roaring back in the 1950s and the 1960s among um, sort of this reactionary group of the Republican Party who hates the New Deal, not so much because of its uh, of its racial legacy, although they certainly don't love that either, but primarily because they don't want to regulate business. And this is the marriage of the people who don't like the idea of regulation of business to the racism and sexism of the traditionalists, old Southern Democrats, and also the the uh, even you know, the, the the fundamentalist Christians of the early 20th century. And that's the idea that if the government tries to level the playing field um, by regulating business and providing a basic social safety net and promoting infrastructure, that it is in fact redistributing wealth. So what does that mean? Well, it means that if you are opposed to that New Deal government, if you're opposed to the basic social safety net that includes Social Security and Medicare and now Medicaid from the 1960s and and you know all the things that we in many ways take for granted, or if you are opposed to government regulation with the idea that that is somehow impinging on a uh, capitalist's right to spend his money however he wants and to employ people in whatever conditions he wants, um, or if you're opposed to the idea of public works pro uh, uh, programs or public, public works like roads, you think those should all be privatized, um, the, what, what they did is they argued that those things were fundamentally a redistribution of wealth and that people of color, overwhelmingly poor people and, and increasingly women, voted for those things. So if you believe that those things are bad, what are you going to do? There's a heck of a lot more of us than there are of them. So what do you do? you got to start cutting people away from the vote. You've got to stop people from voting. And the way this happens is that with um, Ronald Reagan in 1986, he's desperate to pre uh, preserve his second major tax cut. And in the midterm elections of 86, there is a discussion among Republican operatives that if they start the idea of a voter, um, it's not voter purity, I'm drawing a blank on the word voter, integrity, voter integrity measure, um, that they will be able to throw African Americans off the rolls. And there's a number of ways you can do that. There's something called voter caging, which is where you um, send a letter to somebody, or it's going to be a postcard, to somebody to check that they live at a certain address. And if they don't send it back, um, then you say they've moved and you toss them off the rolls. So you might just simply have not done it, might have sent it back. But um, or might not have sent it back, but you get thrown off the rolls and you don't know it. And in most places, it takes a while to get back on the rolls. And this is one of the things, one of the ways in which Wisconsin um, Republicans in Wisconsin are trying to get people off the off the rolls. They've done what's called voter caging. That's one way. Um, you can also insist on voter IDs, which is a no-brainer, right? If the government actually sent us voter IDs, all of us voter IDs it would not be a problem. The Republicans have been um, insisting that such a thing is an over-intrusion of the state. We're one of the few countries that doesn't have those. But instead, what we've got is state laws that decide, for example, what kind of ID is legitimate. So in Texas, for example, a, a, hunter, a hunting license or an NRA card is a legitimate uh, form of ID. But a, a student ID or a, a, um, a welfare card is not considered a legitimate form of ID. So you can see there where people say, ah, you should exactly have an ID, but the issue is what kind of an ID is acceptable. That's by state law, and you can arrange those things in such a way that you cut certain people out. Another thing that Texas did a while back when there was a very popular woman running on the ticket and very popular among women is they had a law where your name as you voted had to be exactly the same name as on your ID. Well, that's the case for most men, but for women who marry or divorce, their names aren't the same. And it was actually quite expensive and difficult to get a new ID. So that cut a lot of women out of the vote. So that's another way that you can suppress voter IDs. And that makes me very nervous, uh, not least because People worry a lot about vote, vote hacking in elections on the, on the machines. 
I worry a lot about a lot less about that than a lot of people do because uh, it seems to me that what you do in a state where you have to have the exact same name on your ID as you do when you vote is you can hack into the systems, change someone's name, make me Heather D. Richardson, and suddenly I can't vote. And there's there's no there's no paper trail because I get turned away and I don't leave it behind. So those kind of laws make me very, very nervous. So there's a lot of different ways to do it. And what you're essentially doing is trying to define certain of your country people as un-American, as not being, uh, not, being, not being worthy of having a say in American society. And it's a very short step from that to saying they don't belong here. They don't have anything to contribute. They're leeches. They're not makers. They're takers. We don't need them. We need to get rid of them. We need to let them die. Or in the late 19th century in the South, that became, and in the North as well, that became not only do we need to let them die, we need to help them along with a noose. So as a scholar of democracy, that kind of language just creeps me out and worries me a lot. And that's one of the reasons I care so much about protecting everybody's right to vote. All right, so that was Victoria Kelly's question. Where else do we want to go? Um, oh, this is an obvious one. Um, uh, I'm going to try and be quick on these because I do want to, there's some specific things I want to get to. Uh, first of all, a question about uh, today, uh, Biden, I'm sorry, Trump said that Biden um, said he would support abortion up to the moment of birth. That's just, that's just nuts. Nobody said that. That's been debunked a million times. And that's, it's one of those things where, where um, Trump and actually a lot of members of the Republican Party take um, a, a gray area and make it absolutely as extremist as possible. What they're talking about is something that is not well defined. It is called late term abortion. And generally that means after 21 weeks when a fetus is sometimes viable or, could, or is viable. And those abortions are about 1% of all abortions. And they are um, for any number of reasons, often because a woman can't get to an abortion clinic because they're so hard to get to, or um, sometimes they're for a fetal abnormality. Sometimes in a very late term abortion, it's because there's been a, a tragedy and both the fetus and the mother are at risk. Um, but uh, what was I also going to say about that? Um, uh, but no, nobody is calling for um, for you know, at one point he's even talking about aborting a fetus after it's born. That's called that's called murder. Um, it, that's just nuts. Uh, so the um, that's one of those hot button issues that I think politicians really use to try and heat up their base. But the reality is most Americans agree that they would like abortion to be legal under certain conditions and illegal under others. And we just got to figure out that the, this is what I say about being the adults in the room. Let's go ahead and figure what, out what exactly what that looks like. Um, I, Mary uh, Remmel Wall. Um, wall live you can't really actually see but that's an l or an i um uh pointed out what is probably at stake here and she didn't say this i don't want to put words in her mouth but uh, one of the drugs that uh, one of the treatments i'm sorry that the president got was created with hu human embryonic stem cells and there's been there's been a lot about that in the news and he probably tweeted that what, out what he did today about biden uh which is a slur he hasn't used since super tuesday um, because he's trying, he, he recognizes that um, evangelicals are going to be furious about the fact he used a treatment that was based in embryonic sound cells, which they oppose. And so it was his way to try and get back on their good side. That's probably why it's there again. Somebody else asked, um, I'm speeding up here because I do want to get to your big question about the election. Somebody else asked about the recent law, I'm sorry, uh, the EPA. Here we go. Let's see if I can find it. I did have notes up here on it. No, that's Constitution which is up here as one would have it. Um, um, I don't, I, okay, I don't know where my notes are, so I'm just gonna do it off the top of my head. Um, about the EPA taking over control of the tribal lands in Oklahoma. Um, um, okay, listen, I'm never happy with anybody taking over tribal lands. Let's just start there. Um, and there's that, the history of that is not even an hour long. The history of that is a lifetime long, and I can't do that here. But what I think is going on, what I think is going on is, I don't know if you were paying attention, I did write about it back in July. There was a Supreme Court decision called McGirt v. Oklahoma, which said essentially that um, for purposes of um, um, uh, criminal um, activity, uh, criminal um, 
enforcement, law enforcement, um, that most of eastern Oklahoma was owned, still owned by, I believe it was the Muscogees, and that they had uh, tribal sovereignty over that region. And that's, that has been something that the state of Oklahoma had for years been exercising authority over. And I believe it's actually Gorsuch who wrote the, the opinion, but I could be wrong about that. I'm totally doing that off the top of my head. And this, I think, uh, this Oklahoma decision, I think, was simply trying to return to the status quo before McGirt v. Oklahoma. I'm simply trying to say we're clawing back our, our previous exercise of authority over these eastern lands. Now, I could be wrong, but it, I think it, it, and it's certainly, there's huge problems with federal authority over tribal lands, less in Oklahoma than in places like uh, Nevada, where they are literally trying to get rid of nuclear waste on Indian reservations. I mean, it's just, it's just, uh, 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 well, you can hear exactly what I think of that. But um, I think that's probably less what's at stake, although certainly they want to use those lands, they, I'm sorry, certainly Oklahoma um, agricultural producers and, um, and oil producers and chemical producers do not have, have happy thoughts about the, that tribal land. But I think in this particular case, it's not a sudden land grab. They simply are trying to go back to the status quo of before July of this year. So, um, so it's, I think it's just a reaction to that Supreme Court decision. Now, how that's going to play out, I don't know. But I know a lot of people are like, oh, my God, what's going on? And I think that's what's going on there. Um, and I'd absolutely be willing to be corrected. But I think it is a direct response to McGirt v. Oklahoma. All right. So now the, the final question here is a couple of final, final questions here. You guys all want to know what happens if a president or, I'm sorry, a candidate dies right now or between now and the inauguration. You all know that if a president dies after having been sworn into office, the vice president becomes the president. And then you know that. So you can use that as your first litmus test. If Trump dies uh, tomorrow, God forbid, um, Pence becomes the president. It has nothing to do with an election. Until the end of Trump's presidency, Mike Pence would step into that position. Um, so that's that's the answer to what happens in here. But obviously we've got an election coming up. And what do we what would happen if to that election if President Trump or anybody else or, or Vice President Biden were to die? Um, so that's more complicated. And that's actually really quite interesting uh, to people like me. Um, so the and, and if I remember, I'll tell you about the 25th, too. But um, so what happens is that, first of all, remember that um, the, the Republican and the Democratic parties are not part of the U.S. government. They are, they're parties, they're outside of that system. And there is a very interesting history of why that is and all that, but they're not official. So what would likely happen, first of all, it's too late to change the ballots. The, the ballots have been printed and there's two states, uh, it, it's too late to change who the, the presidential candidates are with the exception of two states and their deadline is within days. Nobody's changing who's on those ballots at this point. You couldn't print the, the, the ballots soon enough and people are already voting. So likely what would happen is that if, um, um, uh, if something happened to somebody between now and the election, which has never happened before. Now, now in history, in, in, um, in 1872, uh, the Democratic nominee died after the election, but before the inauguration, but he lost in a landslide, so it never came up. It didn't matter. He got some electors, but who cared? He got like... I'm not going to exaggerate and say three, but he didn't get many. Um, that was Horace Greeley. But this never happens. So I'm kind of flying by the seat of my pants here. And that's something to remember, of course, as well, that everybody's flying by the seat of their pants at this point. So you have to remember this other thing, too, is that it's the House of Representatives, ultimately, who decides who's president. So we have a number of layer, uh, layers. So the people elect electors. And the electors in the Constitution are selected by the state legislatures. And that's the slip that a lot of you people have looked at and said, could, could a Republican state go ahead and, and appoint its own electors? Um, and I'll get to that in a, in a second. Um, but then the, the, it's Congress that decides, that opens those ballots and decides who's been elected. And ultimately, it's the House of Representatives who decides who's won, with each state getting one vote. So there's all these layers between this moment and who gets elected. And I'm not done yet because the uh, electors meet on December 16th, I believe, 
but the um, the um, Congress does not open the votes until January 6th, I believe. I hope nobody's taking notes. I'm doing this off the top of my head. But remember, the new the new legislate the new Congress sits on the third of, of of January. So there's again there's a, there's something else happening there in January. And then there's the fact that Trump's term is over, or Pence's term is over if Trump's not alive on January 20th, 20th, 20th. So then somebody else would step in there. And there's a slip there too, because most of us think it would be the Speaker of the House, but there is an argument about the wording of that provision that suggests it should be somebody in the executive branch. That would be litigated forever, let me tell you. Um, so, so what's gonna happen? What would happen? So if something happened, as I say, God forbid to either of them, the respective parties would suggest who they would like to have step into their place. And almost certainly, almost certainly they would pick the vice president, but they don't have to. I mean, they could, they could, I suppose, nominate my neighbor. I don't know, but why would they? I mean, that's, that's one of those things like it could happen, but it's a real long shot. And, and, and there will be such confusion that it seems likely they would say to the electors who are sworn to Biden or Trump, switch your electors to this person and that people would honor that. Um, so I guess what I'm saying is there's an awful lot of curiosity and insecurity about what's going to happen. But now I want to go back to where I was. We're the adults in the room. We get to decide this. We don't have to let it be done to us. So if you care about your states not switching their electors, which, by the way, be a real stretch, they could, theoretically, but that's going to be litigated up the wazoo. Excuse me. That's going to be litigated for a long time. Put pressure on them. You know your state legislators. Call them and say, don't mess around with this crap. You know, I voted for you or I didn't vote for you, but I live here in this district and this is what I want to see. You know, just like when you're dealing with little kids, you don't sit there and say, what's a little kid going to do next? You say, here are your choices. You can pick which of these two choices you take. You don't sort of let the person go off and, and do whatever they want. And that's going to be really important in this month coming up is providing guardrails for where we want our democracy to go. We don't have to let it happen to us. We get to decide what's going to happen and what is acceptable. And this is one of the reasons that Biden will not deal with this question of what are you going to do if Trump doesn't give up? He's like, it's not an option. He doesn't have the option to do that. Let's not make it real by giving it oxygen. Let's say that's not going to happen. He cannot do that and move forward from that position. Now, people have asked me, um, you know, he's got all these litigators. You know, what's he going to do? I got a couple of questions about that. First of all, who's paying all of Donald Trump's lawyers? We, we know the campaign went through $1.1 billion. Who's paying for those lawyers? So that's the first thing. The second thing is make no mistake. Biden's lawyers are the top in the business. And I have written about this. And you might have seen, I actually used the word brilliant describing Bob Bauer. And you've heard me say here before, I've met two geniuses in my lifetime. One was one of my students and one was Bob Bauer. The man is a genius. I mean, I'm, I'm telling you, he is off the charts. And, um, uh, and Biden's got a team like, like nobody's business. So don't think for a minute that Biden is a duck in the water going, you know, a sitting duck in the water going, you know, I don't know what's going on. He's got a crackerjack team that is doing this heavy lifting for us. It's our job to put pressure, you know, that's their job. Our job is to put pressure on our elected officials and say, hey, this is what I want. This is democracy. This is what I want. Um, and this is how I want things to play out. So what I wanted to end you with here is that um, something that Jacqueline Park said, and that is, um, again, here I've talked about the, the role of voters, the role of Americans to play in our democracy and what is the best thing for people to do to guarantee that our democracy continues and it continues healthy. And, um, and this, it's interesting because I'm, I'm, you know, people argue sometimes that I'm a shill for the Democratic Party. I'm actually a shill for American democracy. 
And I hope you heard, I just rigged the Democrats over the coals in uh, the late 19th century and early 20th century American South. They care about democracy. And so if you care about democracy, I don't really care what party you're coming from or what angle you're coming from, but there are things you can do to make sure that voting is free and fair. And that is volunteer to be a poll worker, volunteer to be a poll watcher. That does not mean you show up with an AR-15. That means that there are actual forms you fill out you have to be an official poll watcher. You have to be, you can't just walk in. That's why the, the Trump people are being held outside. You actually have to go through a process and you, you watch the polls. Um, make sure people you know have a way to get their uh, ballots delivered. Make sure that you have your family and friends have ways to get to a polling place. Um, if somebody needs help with child care or with elder care to guarantee that they can get out and vote, make sure that happens. If somebody needs you to have deliver dinner so that they can get out and vote, try and make that happen as well. But in addition to making your voices heard through voting, make your voices heard. And by that, I mean, call your senators and representatives and your local senators and representatives. They get very, very few calls. You know, I can't tell you how few calls they get. And I don't just mean in general, protect American democracy. I mean, invest in the things you care about learn about them and say, you know, I really care about no-knock warrants, or I really care about chokeholds, or I really care about the fact we don't have a coronavirus bill and Trump announced today he's not going to pass one. I really care about the Supreme Court. Whatever it is, find your pressure point and call and call every single day. I have a, an 89-year-old friend who calls Susan Collins every single day. And every single day, she expresses her disappointment with where Susan Collins is. And this, used to, this is a woman who voted for her. Um, and she does it every single day. Well, you know the people on the other end are like, oh my God, she's calling again. But that matters. So call. And then the other piece of that is take up space. Take up space on your yard with yard signs, but take up space in your on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, on TikTok if you do that. Take up space in your local newspapers. Take up space when you write to people and you say, you don't have to say, I hate expletive, whichever member of the Congress you're upset with, but say, I really care about a free and fair vote, or I don't, I'm not happy with where things are going. Because the reality is, as I keep saying, almost all Americans in the 70% actually agree on most of the hot button issues, but we are being kept from agreeing by politicians who need our outrage to continue to be elected. So, um, so speak out and take up oxygen and let's take back the American conversation behind the guardrails of American democracy and look forward to what we're going to create in the future because I looked at Donald Trump on that balcony last night and it was a real wake up call. I've been watching for that moment for a long time and boy last night sure looked like that moment. But that means the work is starting, not ending. And it's going to be exciting, but it's going to be a lot of work. And it's time for us to think about what that looks like. Um, but first, we got to get out and vote and, uh, and see if we can take back American democracy. Thank you guys for being here. Uh, I am doing a, a gig tonight with Joanne Freeman at um, the National Arts Center in New York. Obviously, we're doing it from our respective um, chairs. but. Um, but uh, we always have a good time together. It's free. Uh, you can sign up on my web page or over there. And um, it is being streamed live and it is being recorded. It's streamed live on Facebook, I think. And, uh, and it is being recorded and will be on YouTube if you don't get to it. I don't know what we're going to talk about. It's, but we're supposed to talk about my book, but we, you know, that book came out in April. We'll talk maybe a little bit about it, but mostly what she and I do is we plot um, to take the conversation somewhere else. And that's what we'll do tonight. And in fact, I need to hop off because I've got a call with her to figure out what we're going to talk about. So I hope to see some of you over there. Thank you for coming. And, um, and let's just hold ourselves together for another four weeks. Thanks a lot.